This episode of PPT Presents is brought to you by Pagan Pathways Temple. Pagan Pathways Temple is a 501c3 nonprofit located in Madison Heights, Michigan. We offer classes, community outreach, ritual space, and a lending library for our members. To find out more or to become a member, please visit paganpathwaystemple.com or patreon.com slash paganpathwaystemple. Pagan Pathways Temple, growing in the old ways where all paths are open. This PPT Presents broadcast is brought to you by TechWitch Detroit. TechWitch Detroit, for all your IT needs. Please visit us on the web at techwitchdetroit.com. TechWitch Detroit, we can help. All of the opinions expressed on this show are those of the hosts or guests and do not necessarily express the views of Pagan Pathways Temple or its affiliates. Welcome to PPT Presents, Episode 23. Thank you for listening. Today on PPT Presents, we have, first, for some grown-up story time, we have Jester D reading The Magic Bonbons by L. Frank Bohm. Next, we have It Makes You Think with Cynthia Day and Fur. They will be talking about how to navigate differences of opinion. After that, we have our new series, Coming Out of the Broom Closet. Our featured witch this week is Ms. Nancy Gladstone. Nancy is an active member of our community who also happens to be a member of the board of directors serving as our treasurer. If you have a story you'd like to share, please record it and send us an email at paganpathwaystemple at gmail.com. You may be featured in an upcoming podcast. Also, please join us on our Facebook community group as we celebrate gratitude in May. We can be found at facebook.com slash groups slash Pagan Pathways Temple. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Hello, this is Jester D. The story I'm going to share today is from the author of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, L. Frank Baum. In this tale, published in 1901, magic is not demonized. Instead, it is simply a tool. With no further ado, I present The Magic Bonbons. There lived in Boston a wise and ancient chemist by the name of Dr. Dawes, who dabbled somewhat in magic. There also lived in Boston a young lady by the name of Clarabelle Suds, who possessed of much money, little wit, and intense desire to go upon the stage. So Clarabelle went to Dr. Dawes and said, I can neither sing nor dance. I cannot recite verse nor play upon the piano. I am no acrobat, nor leaper, nor high kicker, yet I wish to go upon the stage. What shall I do? Are you willing to pay for such accomplishments? asked the wise chemist. Certainly, answered Clarabelle, jingling her purse. Then come to me tomorrow at two o'clock, he said. All that night he practiced what is known as chemical sorcery, so that when Clarabelle Suds came next day at two o'clock, he showed her a small box filled with compounds that closely resembled French bonbons. This is a progressive age, said the old man, and I flatter myself your Uncle Dawes keeps right along with the procession. Now, one of your old-fashioned sorcerers would have made you some nasty, bitter pills to swallow, but I have consulted your taste and convenience. Here are some magic bonbons. If you eat this one with a lavender color, you can dance thereafter as lightly and gracefully as if you had been trained a lifetime. After you consume the pink confection, you will sing like a nightingale. Eating the white one will enable you to become the finest elocutionist in the land. The chocolate piece will charm you into playing the piano better than Rubenstein. Well, after eating the lemon yellow bonbon, you can easily kick six feet above your head. How delightful, exclaimed Clarabelle, who was truly enraptured. You are certainly a most clever sorcerer, as well as a considerate compounder and she held out her hand for the box. Ahem, said the wise one. A check, please. Oh, yes, to be sure. How stupid of me to forget. She returned. He considerately retained the box in his own hand while she signed a check for a large amount of money, after which he allowed her to hold the box herself. Are you sure you have made them strong enough? She inquired anxiously. It usually takes a great deal to affect me. My only fear replied Dr. Dawes, is that I have made them too strong, for this is the first time I've ever been called upon to prepare these wonderful confections. Don't worry, said Clarabelle. The stronger they act, the better I shall act myself. She went away after saying this, but stopped in at a dry goods store to shop. 
she forgot the precious box in her new interest and left it lying on the ribbon counter. Then little Bessie Boswick came to the counter to buy a hair ribbon and laid her parcels beside the box. When she went away, she gathered up the box with her other bundles and trotted off home with it. Bessie never knew, until after she had hung her coat in the hall closet and counted up her parcels, that she had one too many. Then she opened it and exclaimed, Why, it's a box of candy! Someone must have mislaid it, but it's too small a matter to worry about. There are only a few pieces. So she dumped the contents of the box into a bonbon dish that stood upon the hall table, and picking out the chocolate piece, she was fond of chocolates, ate it daintily while she examined her purchases. These were not too many, for Bessie was only twelve years old, and she was not yet trusted by her parents to expend much money at the stores. But while she tried on the hair ribbon, she suddenly felt a great desire to play upon the piano, and the desire at last became so overpowering that she went into the parlor and opened the instrument. The little girl had, with infinite pains, contrived to learn two pieces which she usually executed with a jerky movement of a right hand and a left that forgot to keep up and so made dreadful discords. But under the influence of the chocolate bonbon, she sat down and ran her fingers lightly over the keys, producing such exquisite harmony that she was filled with amazement at her own performance. That was the prelude, however. The next moment she dashed into Beethoven's Seventh Sonata and played it magnificently. Her mother, hearing the unusual burst of melody, came downstairs to see what musical guest had arrived, but when she discovered it was her own little daughter who was playing so divinely, she had an attack of palpitations of the heart, to which she was subject, and sat down upon the sofa until it should pass away. Meanwhile, Bessie played one piece after another with untiring energy. She loved music and now found that all she need do was sit at the piano and listen and watch her hands twinkle over the keyboard. Twilight deepened in the room and Bessie's father came home and hung up his hat and overcoat and placed his umbrella in the rack. Then he peeked into the parlor to see who was playing. Great Caesar, he exclaimed, but the mother came to him softly with her finger on his lips and whispered, Don't interrupt her, John. Our child seems to be in a trance. Did you ever hear such superb music? Why, she's an infant prodigy, gasped the astounded father. Beats blind Tom all hollow. It's, it's wonderful. As they stood listening, the senator arrived, having been invited to dine with them that evening. And before he had taken off his coat, the Yale professor, a man of deep learning and scholarly attainments, joined the party. Bessie played on, and the four elders stood in a huddled but silent and amazed group listening to the music and waiting for the sound of the dinner gong. Mr. Bostwick, who was hungry, picked up the bonbon dish that lay on the table beside him and ate the pink confection. The professor was watching him, so Mr. Bostwick courteously held the dish toward him. The professor ate the lemon yellow piece, and the senator reached out his hand and took the lavender piece. He did not eat it, however, for chancing to remember that it might spoil his dinner, he put it in his vest pocket. Mrs. Bostwick, still intently listening to her precocious daughter, without thinking what she did, took the remaining piece, which is the white one, and slowly devoured it. The dish was now empty, and Clarabelle Sud's precious bonbons had passed from her possession forever. Suddenly, Mr. Bostwick, who was a big man, began to sing in a shrill, tremolo soprano voice. It was not the same song Bessie was playing, and the discard was shocking that the professor smiled. The senator put his hands to his ears, and Mrs. Bostwick cried in a horrified voice, William! Her husband continued to sing, if endeavoring to emulate the famous Christine Nilsson, and paid no attention whatever to his wife and his guests. Fortunately, the dinner gong now sounded. Mrs. Boswick dragged Bessie from the piano and ushered her guest into the dining room. Mr. Boswick followed, singing The Last Rose of Summer, as if it had been an encore demanded by a thousand delighted hearers. The poor woman was in despair at witnessing her husband's undignified actions and wondered what she might do to control him. The professor seemed more grave than usual. The senator's face wore an offended expression, and Bessie kept moving her fingers as if she still wanted to play the piano. Mrs. Bostwick managed to get them all seated, although her husband had broken into another aria, and then the maid brought in the soup. When she carried a plate to the professor, he cried in an excited voice, Hold it higher! Higher, I say! And springing up, he gave it a sudden kick that sent it nearly to the ceiling. For once the dish descended to scatter soup over Bessie and the maid and to smash into pieces upon the crown of the professor's bald head. At this atrocious act, the senator rose from his seat with an exclamation of horror and glanced at the hostess. For some time, Mrs. Boswick had been staring straight ahead with a dazed expression. But now, catching the senator's eye, she bowed gracefully and began reciting the charge of the light brigade in forceful tones. The senator shuddered. Such disgraceful writing had never been seen nor heard before in a decent private family. 
he felt that his reputation was at stake, and being the only sane person apparently in the room, there was no one with whom he might appeal. The maid had run away to cry hysterically in the kitchen. Mr. Boswick was singing, Oh, Promise Me. The professor was trying to kick the globes off the chandelier. Mrs. Boswick had switched her recitation to The Boy Stood on the Burning Deck, and Bessie had stolen into the parlor and was pounding out the overture from The Flying Dutchman. The senator was not at all sure he would not go crazy himself presently, so he slipped away from the turmoil, and catching up his hat and coat in the hall, hurried from the house. That night, he sat up late writing a political speech he was to deliver the next afternoon at Funeral Hall, but his experience at the Boswicks had so unnerved him that he could scarcely collect his thoughts, and often he would pause and shake his head pityingly as he remembered the strange things he had seen in that unusually respectable home. The next day he met Mr. Bostwick in the street, but passed him by with a stony glare of oblivion. He felt he really could not afford to know this gentleman in the future. Mr. Bostwick was naturally indignant at the direct snub, yet in his mind lingered a faint memory of some quite unusual occurrences at his dinner party the evening before, and he hardly knew whether he dared to resent the senator's treatment or not. The political meeting was the feature of the day, for the senator's eloquence was well known in Boston. So the big hall was crowded with people, and one of the front rows sat the Bostwick family, with the learned Yale professor beside them. They all looked tired and pale, as if they had passed a rather dissipated evening, and the senator was rendered so nervous by seeing them that he refused to look in their direction a second time. While the mayor was introducing him, the great man sat fidgeting in his chair, and happened to put his thumb and finger in his vest pocket. He found the lavender-colored bonbon he had placed there the evening before. This may clear my throat thought the senator, and slipped the bonbon into his mouth. A few minutes afterwards, he arose before the vast audience, which greeted him with enthusiastic praises. My friends, began the senator in a grave voice, this is a most impressive and important occasion. Then he paused, balanced himself upon his left foot, and kicked his right leg into the air in the way favored by ballet dancers. There was a hum of amazement and horror from the spectators, but the senator appeared not to notice it. He whirled around on the tips of his toes, kicked right and left in a graceful manner, and startled a bald man in the front row by casting a languishing glance in his direction. Suddenly, Clarabelle Suds, who happened to be present, uttered a scream and sprang to her feet, pointing an accusing finger at the dancing senator. She cried in a loud voice, That's the man who stole my bonbons! Seize him! Arrest him! Don't let him escape! But the ushers rushed her out of the hall, thinking she had gone suddenly insane, and the senator's friends seized him firmly and carried carried him out of the stage entrance to the street, where they put him into an open carriage and instructed the driver to take him home. The effect of the magic bonbon was still powerful enough to control the poor senator, who stood upon the rear seat of the carriage and danced energetically all the way home, to the delight of the crowd of small boys who followed the carriage and the grief of the sober-minded citizens who shook their heads sadly and whispered that another good man had gone wrong. It took the senator several months to recover from the shame and humiliation of this escapade, and, curiously enough, he never had the slightest idea of what induced him to act in so extraordinary a manner. Perhaps it was fortunate the last bonbon had now been eaten, for they might easily have caused considerably more trouble than they did. Of course, Clarabel went again to the wise chemist and signed a check for another box of magic bonbons. But she must have taken better care of these, for she is now a famous vaudeville actress. This story should teach us the folly of condemning others for the actions we do not understand, for we never know what may happen to ourselves. It may also serve as a hint to be careful about leaving parcels in public places, and incidentally, to let other people's packages severely alone. Thank you for listening to Storytime with Jester D. Everybody be safe out there. Much love. And now it's time for It Makes You Think by Cynthia Day. Subjects that are sufficiently complicated, enough to give one pause, just enough to make you think. Hi, and welcome to the 23rd edition of It Makes You Think. I'm Cynthia Day, and this is Fur. Say hello, Fur. Hi, Fur. <laughs> and uh, today we're going to be talking about how to talk about different opinions um as pagans we all know that um or at least most of us know that we regard that all paths are sacred within the various pagan faiths and yes. we generally have um an acceptance of individuality being pagans because in the first place we're rebels we take our leave from the status quo 
and we make up our own rules. And one of the most important rules is the rule of individuality and the rules, yes. the rules that um, everybody's journey is sacred, even though it's uh -huh. different from yours. Have anything to say to that, Fur? Uh -huh. Do you have anything to say to that, to that extent? Um, no, um, a lot of people have different paths that they follow and you take different some people take different journeys in as much as that they go different routes and some go different speeds. That's true. And yet, um, in some cases within the different faiths, we differ because people uh -huh. tend to cling to opinions that they have. And sometimes they cast aspersions of other people's ways within certain, certain, um, modes of, uh, belief or modes of behavior within that belief. And I don't think it ought to be this way because some people have an example. Some people often refer to some Wiccans as being fuzzy bunnies. Have you heard that term before? Fur? Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. I'm, I'm breaking up a little bit? Okay. Yeah. Well, Fur is joining me on Zoom, so we're yes. going to try to keep this going. But what yes. I was saying was, is that fuzzy bunnies, have you heard the term? <laughs> you introduced me to it. It was kind of cute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole uh, idea that um, the uh, the kind of Wiccan that is just all white light and uh, everything's nice, nice, and they 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 see the world with like rose colored glasses, and they oh, yeah. they eschew anything that might be negative in their in their mindset. And there are those that feel like, oh, well, they're not really real because they don't get down to the nitty gritty of what it means to be a witch or what it means to be a pagan. Um, and some people differ on those things. Yes. So um, I think it's important to remember that everybody's journey is sacred. Everybody's mm -hmm. journey, uh, whether it's spiritual or whether we're talking about mental. Um, it's important not to... Um, Judge. Yeah. And not superimpose what you're learning on your journey onto someone else's journey. Because even though a person may be going through what seems to be very similar to what you're going through, they may take away completely different meaning and lessons from a same or similar situation than you would. And that's due to their individuality. And sometimes it's the maturity level too. Yeah. And a different, and not only, but everybody has a different starting point. Not everybody has the same starting point. They had, they grew up in different family life. Mm -hmm. You have different um, economic status when you know, it's, that stuff, you can't really change that much. It, some people are just born into money. Some people are born into poverty. Mm -hmm. And they learn different lessons at different times. And it's, some people know how to live harder life than others. Yeah. yeah. That's for certain. And some people are very touchy about it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when there are disagreements from one person's journey to another, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't it doesn't help when you're trying to relate what you're going through to someone else who just can't relate for whatever reason. Their journey may be so different that they just mm -hmm. they can't relate, and it doesn't help to try to, as I said, superimpose over their journey, what you've learned on yours, because they just may not be ready. There are a lot of times when people just aren't really ready um, for information, even information that could help them. 
Like, case in point, um, I was in an abusive relationship. I speak on that many times sometimes on these podcasts because I, I learned a lot from it. But one yeah. of the things that I went through, and I think um, you, Jennifer, also went through, was that after you were out of the situation, people would come to you and say, gee, you know, I really uh-huh. wish I could have told you this. I wish I could have told you that. And you sit there and you're like, why didn't you tell me? And the I answer is... You get mad afterwards, but... Yeah, you get mad afterwards because you're like, why didn't you tell me? And the fact is, is that even if they did tell you at that time, chances are you weren't ready to take in the information. You're in denial. You, you, you were right. And when it comes down to, especially once you have children, you realize how much... People don't want to be told what to do. Yeah. And be told what's the best for you. Yeah. It, no, I know me better than anybody else. No, 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 no. And, and you're going to kick your, you're going to kick your heels in and you're going to hold your ground. Yeah. Long people, people. <laughs> people double down. They do. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting though. As, as a pagan, when we meet other people that may be um, what we might consider eligible to talk about metaphysical or pagan things with, how do we know um, when a person is ready to enter into a conversation about paganism? Mm-hmm. And it's an, it's an interesting question because you're off you you take the chance of walking into a disagreement whenever you oh, bring yeah. paganism up oh yeah um because sometimes i've gotten into conversations with people who i did not know very well about paganism and um it went really well because i could tell that they were really open to the conversation mm-hmm. but i've also gotten into conversations that were very short because the person was definitely not open to it mm-hmm. and i remember when um I was first introduced to paganism. I was working at a job and I had been there for about two months because I was a temporary. And I had been on a journey looking for enlightenment of some kind for a long time. And the people that I was working with apparently had been listening and observing me. And Mm -hmm. then one day, one of them just sort of sideways made the comment that, there was going to be a chocolate ritual at a friend's coven. And I, he said that in my hearing range. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah. And I was like, wow, that sounds really interesting. And then he knew that he could say the very next thing, which was, well, I'm glad you said that because they'd love to have you come and visit. I'm like, really? They know about me? He says, yeah, I, I kind of told them about kind of the stuff that you were into. And, you know, I, it seems like you'd probably get along with them really, really well. And they, they'd love to have you come over. I was like, yeah, I'd love to do that. Where is it? And blah, blah, blah. And the next thing I know, I'm showing up at some stranger's doorstep all by myself. Um, yeah. And I opened the door and a whole new world was opened on to me. Mm-hmm. That very moment. I'll never forget it. Yeah. My, my thing was this. Uh, I got into uh, some of my college courses. I, I started sociology. Sociology? That was my- Huh? Sociology? Sociology. Okay. And I I love to study different societies, different way people lived and different cultures. And I began, the more I explored other cultures, the more open I was to different religions. Hmm. And I kind of took up with a few different friends and we I, I explored different Wiccan um stuff and you know just different ways to look at things and and druidic paths and stuff of that nature but i was pretty much a solitary but um no it it opened my mind to different things Mm -hmm. but you were ready for those things because you were ready for those things because you had already put yourself in sociology in a situation in which you were going to learn about new stuff yeah, I love people. People are interesting to yes. me. They're yes, uh, people are. Weird, different, and all kinds of different things. Yep. 
So, yeah, you can't when you're when you know that you're going to get into a conversation with someone um, about paganism, you kind of have to. Uh, how 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 do you know that you can open up to them? And you look for signs of what they're into. And I guess you kind of look for what feeling do you have with this person? And what have you observed about the person? I think these yeah. are the things that they probably uh, checked out with me and figured out, yeah, you know, she's, she's probably a good candidate for, you know, inviting mm -hmm. if it's something that she wants to do. And I think it's important to note that that requires a lot of patience with people. Yeah. Observation. Observation and patience. Yeah. Um, a type of observation that, um, doesn't pigeonhole a person it, it leaves everything open for what that person may bloom into being but it's also interesting to note that when you're doing this you're entering another person's mental and spiritual space by invitation mm -hmm. by invitation only and i kind of consider that a sacred duty as a pagan to to keep any kind any type of conversation like that sacred, and because it's important in my eyes to honor the person who they were before they came upon this information, who they are now, and who they're going to be, and to honor the journey and where they are now in it, uh -huh. and also honor their inquisitiveness because it's a representation of their own personal growth their own searching and and like their longing for enlightenment comes out in their curiosity. And when you see that and you feel that, you know that you can likely open up, like my friend did, sort of sideways and bring in different um, different topics and see how they respond to it. But you also have to respect their, their space in as much as that you you cannot force enlightenment. No, there's no way you can. It's, yeah. it's one you can't force enlightenment. It's one of those things that if a person is ready for it, they're ready for it and they're hungry for it. You know. Yes. That and you have to respect the fact that um if they're not ready for it or they don't want to go there, it doesn't make them lesser of a person or it, it's just they're not their path or not their time. Yeah, not their time. And it doesn't make you better of a person because you have different feelings or beliefs. Right. And just different. Yeah. Some, some pagans and some that get into the pagan beliefs and stuff, they will get almost, uh, I, I don't like to veer towards the people that like get on a high horse mm -hmm. like I, I'm better than you because I'm more enlightened and I see this way because it, it kind of brings me back to some of the any it has more to do with the person than the religion or stuff but um, it, that happens so much with Christianity and at some of the you know big three religions you know mm -hmm. I'm you know, look at me. I, I'm better than you because I believe this way. Nobody is better than anybody else. We all, we all breathe the same air. We all bleed red. It's, we're going to all die. And, and we have different reflections, different ideas on what this life is about. And everybody is entitled to their opinion. And some may be more open to others' opinions. Then some, a, a closed mind, and it, it, it's not going to open from the outside. It's going to open from the end. Right. And it's important to know that you can't, just like you can't put God in a box, you can't put enlightenment in a box because you never no. know what you're going to get. You never know what that enlightenment is going to be about. So, mm -hmm. um, keeping that option open that enlightenment could be about anything at any time. For a person, yeah, yeah, and and it's it's also important to note that um, just as much as their spiritual journey is sacred, 
their mental journey is also sacred. Uh -huh. um, and you also enter on that, hopefully by invitation as well. Yeah. I tend to like to, to call things in terms of journeys because um, that's the way I look at it. It's like everybody is where they are right now, learning everything they need to learn or mm -hmm. not learning what they need to learn and learning the consequences of that. You know, that's, that's, uh, I tend to, um, to look at things that way. Yeah. And there's, e even if you're not making an attempt to learn from anything right now or any other time, you are observing, you are gaining knowledge from whatever is happening in your life right now. Mm -hmm. Whether you like it or not, you are changing, you are learning. Even if it is what not to do later. And <laughs> I've had a lot of those experiences. What I will not put up with. But mm -hmm. you, you learn from being taught all the time. That's true. We, we learn from being taught. We learn from experience. And hopefully we learn from other people's experience. I had a friend tell me once that... I had a teacher actually tell me once that some people are wise... And some people are otherwise, meaning that <laughs> some people just have to go through things. And sometimes yep. you have to sit back and watch. Uh, You're one of those. <laughs> is that what you just said? Yep. <laughs> I, you know, I have to, go ahead. I have to fall over and uh, uh, learn how to get back up. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've fallen many a time over many different things and had to crawl my way back up. A lot of people do. I think all of us do at some point. At least but learning how to walk. I mean, we all did that. What's that? You got to accept the falls. You got to accept and expect them. You can't believe that you can go your whole life without failure. Yeah. It, it, it'll be a long time. You got It's what happens with the failure. It, no baby learns how to walk the first time they stand up. No, they got to toddle over and stuff. That's why they're called toddlers. They run into things throughout your whole life. You're going to fall over from this, that, and the other thing. Whether it's, you know, you lose your house or you, you drop this and your, you know, your, your marriage fails, this happens. Well, when you fall, you got to look at, you know, do some, self-reflection and say, well, what happened here that I can learn from? Mm -hmm. What wrong? And try to be honest with yourself. Yeah, you got to be honest with yourself because when you start lying to yourself, bad things can happen. And you didn't learn a dang thing. <laughs> yeah, and you didn't learn a dang thing if you end up lying to yourself. That's true. <laughs> so if you're in, yeah. <laughs> if you've got one person's journey... And it's sort of bumping up against another person's journey in a bad way, then you're going to be having um, difficult conversations. Head butting. Head butting, yeah. Um, and I would recommend proceeding at the pace of the person where they're at right now. You know, it's it's kind of like honor where they are right now in whatever they believe or want to believe and know that that is their experience that they're having. And mm -hmm. I tend to want to validate a person's experience when, um, whenever I find myself in a difficult conversation, because mm -hmm. although I know that they may not be taking from it, what I'm taking from it, what they're taking is what they're learning right now. And that to me is sacred. And I don't yes. want to interfere with that. Um, but at the same time, I want to be accountable for my thinking uh, and for my right to agree to disagree. But the only thing we can really do in those situations is hopefully encourage consciousness. Um, but you also have to accept 
that you're not going to change no. anybody else. No, you're not going to change anybody else. Everybody changes from the inside, not from the outside. Mm -hmm. And it's important not to label somebody else's journey and say um, what their journey is. That's for them to decide, mm -hmm. not you. It's important to be able to agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. But if you can't, it's important to learn how to completely disengage because you may just be wasting your breath on some things if a person is just not ready. You get be frustrated for no dang reason. Yeah, because if a person is, is not ready or open to take enlightenment from any experience um, at the moment, sometimes stepping away, they may remember that. And they may remember it sometime in the future, and you may have left seeds in their mind for something in the future, and they'll look back and they'll say, hey, maybe I should have learned something back there because this now applies. And just, I, I had a relationship with, I had a long-term relationship with an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much I tried to help him, no matter how much I tried to show him ways to recover, ways to get help, it, it just wasn't happening, so I had to step away. Yeah. No matter how hard it was, it, it broke up my family. It, it, it was just something you cannot do, but you got to realize what you're willing to put up with because it was harming me physically and emotionally. Mm -hmm. Because I, the stress causes you to lose sleep. It causes all kinds of physical reoccurring problems. Mm -hmm. I know, I know where you speak because when I was, um, a young girl, I had, um, a somewhat older boyfriend who I didn't know what alcoholism was. I was so protected as a child. I, I had no clue. Uh, but I knew that there was oh, something wow. wrong with him. Yeah. I knew there was something wrong with him. So I cajoled him into going to a psychologist appointment. And he was drinking all the way there and, you know, was drinking wow. wine in the car as we drove up. And uh, before he went in, he had to take another swig. And wow. so we get up to the to the psychologist's appointment. And, of course, he's smelling and burping up wine. And we're sitting there and the psychologist is looking at the dynamics between me and this boyfriend of mine. And he's understanding that I really don't know what I'm dealing with. And so he, he asked the guy to leave the room because the, the session was pretty much over. But he's turned to me and he said, if you don't leave him now, you're going to become just like him. I know you don't understand what's going on with him, but he's an alcoholic. And maybe, yeah. maybe you don't understand what alcoholic is, but let me explain it to you this way. You're his girlfriend right now. But right now, he's in a relationship with Ethel. And ethyl alcohol will always win over you. Yeah. And until That's he decides to put thing. ethyl down, she's going to be his first girlfriend. And you're always going to be tagging along. And you may end up just like him. Mm -hmm. And then he said, the only thing that might turn him around is if you leave. There's yeah. no guarantee. But he's so close to you, it might cause him to double think his relationship with... uh with Ethel. But Everybody if you had to bottom out. Yeah, he had he had to bottom out. And um I left that session thinking to myself, Oh my God. I was young. I was impressionable. And I was like, I don't want to be like him. And I don't mm -hmm. want him to be this way. And if, if it would help him, I gotta leave. Yeah. I was a very rational kid. And so I left him and he hit bottom. The thing is he never came up from that. He died an alcoholic. Uh -huh. I would check on him 10 years past, 20 years past, because they lived around the corner from me at the time. But he was always in the bottle. And there was nothing anybody could do. And certainly there was nothing, any, anything that I could do at the time that I was with him. And I'm so yeah. thankful to the psychologist for telling me the truth in a way that I could understand, because at that time, I was looking for enlightenment about the problem. I didn't like what I found out, but I acted on it. Mm -hmm. And I learned from it. 
unfortunately, he didn't. But you were what you were ready and willing to accept the knowledge. You were ready. Exactly. To- that session was more for me than it was for him, but I didn't realize mm-hmm. it at the point. At that point. Mm-hmm. So a little bit about my past. Eh. I was a thick headed kid, but that got through. But it's an it's also um important to note. That even in seemingly light conversation, you can get into a scrape that you don't want to be into. Yeah. Conversations can sometimes go south. Conversations can be very, um, emotionally volatile. And you don't want, you don't want to get into that if you can avoid it. Sometimes when people are being very quiet, they can be seething inside. But, you can watch for emotional tells that they will give off. And if you don't know what a tell is, if you don't know what a tell is, you know how you feel inside. And if you're in a conversation with somebody, you feel like you feel prickly or you feel uneasy or you feel like for some reason you have to explain yourself over and over and over again because this person's just not getting it. Or if you feel that there's a softly implied insult or even a direct insult, and it's yeah. important to know what an insult really is. Any kind of disrespect versus yourself versus ideas. Anything that is offensive, um, an action or words. You start getting that, it's time to backpedal away from the conversation because bad things can happen um, when conversations go south. It's no longer a conversation when the person is not holding you in any kind of respect. And if you feel that respect is gone, then it's no longer a conversation. It's an argument. Yeah. And bad things happen with arguments. Mm -hmm. So in a discussion or a debate, there's respect on both sides. But when insults enter in, um, that's when emotions flare. And many times people really identify with what it is that they're talking about. Yeah, especially when you're talking about um, anything that's near and dear to them. Mm-hmm. Usually, uh, with with what they identify as, uh, that's why everybody was uh, always used to be one of those things. So you don't discuss politics, religion, and one other money, politics, money. religion, and money. Yeah. Yep. Why is you that? Don't... Because people identify so wholeheartedly, especially with religion. Uh, you know, I am blank. Mm-hmm. I am this. Mm-hmm. I am and I am Muslim, whatever. And I am pagan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, you know, beliefs are a hard thing because um, when you believe in something, there's... There's not really physical proof. Mm-hmm. You know, go outside and prove that the there's snow falling in freaking May. But <laughs> there was today. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, but the thing is, is that you can't prove so easily that there is God or Yahweh or what you believe that we should call the ultimate being, or if there is an ultimate being altogether. Mm-hmm. And belief in and of itself is defined as um, the idea that there is something that you cannot prove. Mm-hmm. Science has, you know, you you can go out and prove science. You you, you have to believe in something. Right? That's why there's trial and error in science. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a scientific method to establish there's a scientific facts. Method. There's no scientific method to establish belief. Yes. Right. And so and politics, politics are the same way. Yep. And different ways to govern society or your... Different you know, people, like different society. parties. Yep, the different parties, the you know, and how people should be run and... And 
um, it, it, it all gets messy. If you cannot keep above the water with, you know, keep from insulting other people because they believe uh, or they have different ideas than you do, then step away. It, it's, if it starts getting to the point and we lost a lot of that ability to respect for other people, even though that they believe or they take a different side from us. And once upon a time, you know, it, it was philosophy. There were, there was abilities for people to discuss philosophy and religion in different ways and not be, wholeheartedly offended or pissed off and, you know, upset over everything because somebody had a different belief than you. Mm -hmm. In our Western society, I, I don't know much about current Eastern society, but if you say, well, my daughter was treated this way because of this, that, and the other thing, and that's just wrong, I, especially with some of the current problems we're having today um, with this COVID stuff, um, people get really... They get livid. Yeah. They do, because you're talk on one side you're talking about life and death, and on the other side you're talking about finances, which is also something that people don't want to talk about, uh, such as liberties. money. It's equally people as nebulous. Liberties. Right. Uh, the, the whole thing about not talking about religion is nebulous. Not talking about um, politics, which is also equally as nebulous, and money, which is a concept that it seems like it should make sense, but sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So you get caught up in any type of any one of those conversations, you run into the possibility of denting someone's identity in some way yes. or offending them in some way. So, yeah, step away. Uh, one of the best ways to step away when a conversation is going south is to acknowledge the other person's way of, of thinking. Mm -hmm. Validate them in some way. Let them know that, yeah, this is what you believe. This is this is where you're at. I get that. You know, and that becomes less offensive, I would hope. Um, yeah. it's important because to learn how stating, to de-escalate those conversations. Yeah, you're stating that you know, or this is what I understand from what you just told me, mm -hmm. that it validates what you're speaking upon because you're you're displaying the fact that you are actually listening to them instead mm -hmm. of just wanting to talk. Yeah, restate it, yeah. Because uh, a lot of people, instead of um, actually... Um, listening to the other person, you know, or what they're stating, they just keep quiet for a few minutes while you state whatever opinion you have, and then they just jump in and attack. Right. It's it's not really conversation. It's just two people squawking at each other at some point. You know, so it, it's <laughs> like <laughs> literally squawking like a couple what? of cats, right? Because neither one of them is communicating. Communicating means getting one idea across to the other, and if all you're doing is slamming ideas into each other nothing's getting across so no. restating what Not another person has said really helps mm -hmm. um it helps to see their side to see how they feel um but in stepping away sometimes you have to come up with excuses like mm -hmm. you're tired um you have a phone call to make um, you have other dinner. plans, a meeting, dinner, uh, you have an appointment, whatever excuse it takes. Because in actuality, some people, it's not safe to be in that kind of a conversation with, but you may not realize it until you're already there. So how do you back out of it? You know, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you get a gut mm -hmm. reaction in the middle of a conversation that um, this person is inten intentionally trying to trigger you. Yeah. And when you feel that rising within yourself, when you feel those red flags, it's time to disengage. Yeah, and sometimes they will escalate, especially if, even if it has nothing to do with whatever is stressing them. If they have stress from home or work or whatever, or just the lifestyle that we're 
having right now, Mm -hmm. that stuff will escalate and they might take out their other stressors on you. I have seen people get violent over the dumbest things. Mm -hmm. And I I know what you're talking about. Dumb things like, oh, the radio's up too loud. Oh, the window should be closed. You know, it's simple things like that. And people go to fisticuffs and worse. You know, um, like I said, when the discussion or debate goes south and respect is lost on either side, the insults start flying. The emotions start getting stepped on. It's time to step away. Acknowledge, um, while things are going south before the, before the fiery things start happening, stay yeah. safe. And if it's the last thing that you remember from today, respecting your journey and what you learn, even in these situations that are, that are difficult to talk about, difficult conversations, mm-hmm. realize that even though you may not get your point across, that you may have left a trail of crumbs for a person to follow at some point in their life um, and realize looking back that, wait a minute, this actually made sense and makes sense to me now. And at that point, sometime in the future, they may be open to changing their mind, but it doesn't mean that while you're with them that they will. Nine times out of 10, that's not going to happen unless that person is actually looking for enlightenment. At the moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And those people are rare. It's good yeah. to find them, but they're rare. And you might also learn the, what not to do another time or what to look for in other people when, you know, when they're not agreeable mm-hmm. or to accept a difference in opinion. Well, maybe I should have stated it in a different way. There's always something to learn from every experience. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's part of our journey to learn exactly that, what to do mm-hmm. and what not to do. But whatever well, you do, <laughs> I hope you stay safe. What you laughing at for? Uh, so sometimes you just learn what doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've learned that myself a lot of times, what does not work. Well, I hope that you have enjoyed this session of It Makes You Think. I hope that it's given you some ideas and maybe some clarification on some points. And I hope that it may have even provided some enlightenment on something for you. Um, thank you for listening to It Makes You Think. This is Cynthia Day signing off. Say goodbye, Fur. Bye, Fur. <laughs> all right. And we will talk to you all in the next two weeks with a interesting conversation about something else. All right. Bye-bye. Hi, my name is Nancy. I am treasurer of Pagan's Pathways Temple, and this is my coming out story as a pagan. Mine's a little bit different than most people's, I would think. My daughter, Stephanie, or some of you may know her as Shia Chan, started hanging out with a new group of friends. Um, It was Pagan Pride Day was coming up. She wanted me to go with her and meet this guy named Stan and see what he had to say. He was busy that day, so I really didn't get to spend much time with him. And I thought, like, all the booths were kind of cool. And this was actually kind of cool. Then she took me to a sermon, which was in the back of a bookstore. They had just actually moved to the back of the bookstore, where I listened to a sermon. And then I really got to talk to him and meet him. And I liked his ideals. So I'm thinking, boy, this sounds a lot like me. So maybe I am pagan. I knew I always had these gifts from age five that my sister taught me and just thought nothing behind it. So my daughter introduced me to paganism and I follow it today. 
And because of convocation, I actually realized I was a shaman. I did not know what it was until I attended a Ken Day class. I just thought, oh, I can do these things. I thought everyone can do it. I thought it was natural. My coming out story isn't that long, but that's what happened. And I also am Jewish, so I consider myself a Jewish pagan. Because I still do all the Jewish holidays with my family. And I do the pagan ones as well. So I'm a pagan Jewish shaman. Anyone else's kids show them the religion, I wonder? Or am I a lone wolf out here? Bye! This episode of PPT Presents is brought to you by Pagan Pathways Temple. Pagan Pathways Temple is a 501c3 out of beautiful Madison Heights, Michigan. We offer classes, community outreach, ritual space, and a library available to our members. To find out more or to become a member, please go to paganpathwaystemple.org or patreon.com slash paganpathwaystemple. Pagan Pathways Temple, growing in the old ways where all paths are open. This PPT Presents broadcast is brought to you by TechWitch Detroit. TechWitch Detroit, for all your IT needs. Please visit us on the web at techwitchdetroit.com. TechWitch Detroit, we can help!